Thanks so much, Tracy. I really appreciate it. And it's great to have an opportunity to talk here at South by Southwest Eco. And as, uh, as she mentioned, I'll be talking about my book. And basically, the book tries to explore a central question, which is, why are we obsessed with sharks? And I say this, I always feel like I have to confess at the outset that I am not a shark obsessive, um, even now, even after all this time, although, again, I do have certainly more affection for them now than when I started. Uh, I did not grow up playing, you know, the, doing the role play of between a killer whale and a shark, you know, who ends up winning that contest, although I frequently have to answer that question, particularly when, you know, confronted with an 11-year-old boy. But so it's something I'm prepared to, to address if need be. But I am really interested about why sharks have such an outsized role in our psyche and what does that mean. And so in order to get this perspective, one thing that I really wanted to look at is how have attitudes toward sharks changed over time and across geography and culture and kind of look at what's going on. So really in kind of, I think the, the backdrop for all of this is to look at how island cultures particularly historically viewed sharks. This is actually a current picture, a picture that I took of Salam Karsimbe, a Papua New Guinean shark collar, which is something we can talk about. This is one of the last and, and potentially the last uh, existing faith tradition that is focused on sharks. But if you look back historically, what's interesting is that there are a number of island cultures that really had a faith system centered on sharks. And what's so interesting is that they had in many ways a much more nuanced view of sharks than we have today, particularly here in the United States and in Europe. And so I was very interested in figuring that out. Why is it that the people who lived closest to the sea, who were most dependent on it, actually had a more realistic vision of sharks than we do? And so then if you go forward a little bit and you look at kind of, you know, kind of our classical traditions and, and what happened, you would see that, you know, Phoenician pottery dating back to 3000 BC portrayed sharks. There's a vase from Italy in 725 BC that also, you know, portrayed a shark attack. And what's interesting is the Greeks had a specific uh, entity, which a deity they called Katia, who basically was their description of a shark, uh, really in, in a fairly negative light, uh, where, for example, the Greek poet Oppian talked about, um, you know, for what food shall be sufficient to fill the void of their belly or enough to satisfy and give a respite to their insatiable jaws. So clearly they, they had sharks on their radar screen. Aristotle, better known for his philosophy, gave what, to the best of my knowledge, is the first accurate description of shark sex that we have in modern times, um, where he talked about them going after each other as dogs, and that's actually gave rise to, in part, to the term dogfish, which now describes several species, different species of sharks. And, and so, but what's interesting is that he was, and he actually dubbed them salache, which is this term that we use for, as a category. But, you know, again, it was actually a pretty matter-of-fact description. And then something incredibly interesting happened in the Middle Ages. And what essentially happened is that the Western world forgot that sharks existed. And they were much more focused on, say, the forest and some of those creatures. And when you look at the records from, from for example, medieval, the medieval period, they, for example, took shark's teeth, that fossilized shark's teeth, and they would drop them in their goblets during important ceremonies. They'd call them gloss petre, um, dragon tongue stones. And they basically thought that they, that they came from dragons rather than sharks. And so there was this total break in terms of our understanding of sharks, and I think what's interesting about that is that we really had to forget they existed in order to demonize them. And so what happened is we rediscovered them in the worst possible way, which is through seafaring. And I imagine a bunch of you are familiar with this image, Watson and the shark, depicting, of course, the real life incident involving Brooke Watson, who at the time was a 13-year-old orphan in Cuba who was swimming. He was, he was uh, working on a sailing ship, and he was in the port of Havana. He went for a swim and lost part of one leg to a shark. And here, obviously, you can see that he's, um, uh, you know, that, that he's basically trying to get rescued by his shipmates. And what's so fascinating is that Watson himself actually commissioned this painting. He got John Copley to, to paint it. And Copley had never seen a shark. And it's a little hard to, in fact, particularly hard 
um, here. But what's fascinating, if you look over in the, in the right-hand lower corner where they have the shark, it actually looks like a hippo with lips on it and scary teeth. And that just gives you a sense that even though Copley was being paid by Watson to, you know, to, to paint a shark, he, d he had no idea what it looked like. And in fact, it was, it was shortly, it was, it was, there had been a shark that had been taken to London and put on display before this, but you know, obviously he hadn't seen it. And one thing that I think is so interesting about this is Watson, who actually was a London businessman who had political aspirations, who was, who was vying to be mayor of London at the time he commissioned this painting, really, he, he wanted this painting for a few different reasons, partially to show that he had survived adversity and that basically that others could do so too to kind of inspire others. But also because, you know, obviously he is showing that, that he, he was very interested in portraying himself as someone who had been spared by God, who, you know, basically had overcome incredible odds and so was really using the shark as a device to kind of bolster his own image. And ultimately it paid off. He became a baronet and kind of got recognition from the crown. And I think, you know, it's interesting when you look at, you know, for example, the first reported shark attacks in history was in the 1500s. It was a Portuguese sailor um, who ended up uh, getting getting eaten by a shark. That really, you know, this was this moment where people were only encountering sharks in the worst possible way. They were doing these transatlantic voyages. They, you know, you also have incredible incidents of slave ships that were going over where essentially sharks were following them partially because they were throwing garbage overboard. And then in some cases, cases, they were, you know, even, you know, throwing slaves either who had died because of the totally inhumane uh, conditions or because, of course, they, you know, as an example to the rest of, of, of the slaves who were in the ship. And in fact, an abolitionist in Britain won in, in kind of making an argument for why slavery should be abolished delivered a petition, which was a tongue-in-cheek petition on behalf of the sharks of Africa saying, please, you can't abolish slavery because if you do, what else will we have to eat? And so it gives you a sense that really, time and time again, people were having these incredibly you know, negative experiences with sharks. But it was still a fairly abstract concept to most, for example, Americans until 1916. And that's when there were a series of shark attacks off the Jersey Shore. There were four people who died within a matter of days, less than two weeks. And really, there happened to be you know, widespread panic that, that, that came in the wake of these attacks. It was really a time when Americans were going to the beach for the first time. And so you know, this was kind of a, a, a new tradition that they were doing. And now they suddenly felt vulnerable. And one of the really interesting things, and it's why I pick this Philly Inquirer um, it, front page where you can see it says government to aid fight to stamp out the shark horror. Uh, what's very interesting about this is basically there was this expectation on the part of you know citizens that the government could do something. Woodrow Wilson actually declared, uh, convened a cabinet meeting on sharks, needless to say, didn't really come up with any game plan. Um, and what's interesting is that there are a pair of political scientists, one of whom's now at Vanderbilt, um, one from Princeton, that did an analysis of the 1916 election and found that Woodrow Wilson actually lost votes in New Jersey, where he had been governor, in the areas where sharks, uh, where the shark attacks took place and where they took a hit for tourism. And so this really was something, and it's just very interesting, they charted that for whatever reason, people somehow think that politicians can manage the threat that sharks pose. And in fact, in 2001, in what was referred to as the summer of the shark, a similar thing happened with then Virginia Governor Jim Gilmore, who also had convened a task force because essentially there were a series of shark attacks off uh, Virginia and it was bad for tourism and he felt pressure to act. And so what happens at this time is that, first of all, you know, the United States is not the only place where you're seeing shark strikes. It's also happening off Australia and out off South Africa, where both there are deadly great whites and also because people, again, are starting to get into the water. And so what you see is there's actually a change in the terminology of how people start to refer to sharks. And so, for example, between 1919 and 1932, there are 32, 33 shark bite incidents, 24 of which are fatal. I always say if it's any comfort, you now have a 90% chance of surviving a shark strike. Not so back in uh, the turn of last century. 
And so what I love is that, again, the politicians formed a uh, committee, the New South Wales Shark Menace Committee, and they issued a report. And what's very interesting about this is that they interchangeably use the word shark accidents and shark attacks. And, you know, in some ways this is incredibly reasonable because, and, and we can discuss this, but clearly sharks are not going out and deliberately targeting humans. We're not fatty enough for them, even the fattest among us. And so, you know, there, this is not like a de deliberate hunting activity. But, and, and it seemed that the committee noticed that. But at the same time, and, and Christopher Neff is a doctoral student at the University of Sydney who's, who's chronicled this, there was a Sydney surgeon named Victor Coppelson. And Victor Coppelson, Came, got drawn into this because people wanted a surgeon to obviously help respond to these attacks. And he came up with this idea that they came up with a rogue shark theory, this idea that actually sharks were deliberately hunting humans as prey. And in fact, there's always, there's really no subtlety in the shark literature, which is one thing that I've discovered. So in 1958, he published the book Shark Attack. And really that's the moment, you know, the culmination of this shift from saying, there was a shark accident, the same way that there was, say, a car accident, to the idea that, in fact, you know, sharks were out to get us. And so when I try to think of why, you know, are we so afraid of sharks, and frankly, why are we more, uh, you know, scared by sharks than grizzly bears, than polar bears, than mountain lions, I would say I put all of those up on my list as uh, animals who I have some level of terror associated with. Uh, you know, a lot of what I think it comes down to is that we just have a primal fear, that we are hardwired to fear sharks. Again, partially for good reason, because some of them can eat us, and also because they come out of the darkness. I think we suffer under the illusion, and I would argue that it's an illusion, that, and, and you know, sometimes it works. You come face to face with a polar bear or grizzly bear, Maybe you can scare them off, maybe you can run away, but the idea is that a shark comes out of the darkness in the water and you can't see it. This is a picture of a tiger shark, which my friend Brian Scarry, a photographer at National Geographic took. Um, I always say, I you know, have asked him, how close were you to this shark when you took this picture? And the answer is he was pretty close and he got out, so there you go. But um, it does, I think, you know, speak to why we are so terrified of them. And so while certainly recreational fishing is a, is a problem, it kills more than, say, 200,000 sharks a year off uh, our shores, um, really industrial fishing has been uh, a greater threat. And so this is a thresher shark that, again, my friend Brian took a picture of, caught in a gill net. And so really, when you're often when you're eating tuna or swordfish, one thing to keep in mind is that there are millions of sharks that are killed each year that are caught accidentally in these fisheries that are, you know, depending on how they're done, are often very indiscriminate, and basically sharks are going to go for the same bait that a tuna or a swordfish will go for. But, you know, in terms of the most deliberate threat that sharks face, uh, it's really shark's fin soup. This is a photo that I took in Hong Kong, the center of the shark fin trade, where, you know, we've seen a real explosion of demand for this Asian delicacy, and that's, you know, the real reason that people go out and actually try intentionally to take sharks. 80% of the world's shark's fins end up going through Hong Kong. They go in and go out often um, to places like mainland China. This is Shark's Fin City, a place that I spent time in. But what's interesting is that they're supplied from all over the world. So I was, went to a fish market in Belize where this woman had already sold her fins off this nurse shark and basically was having trouble selling the meat because the meat is not nearly as desirable or as lucrative. Uh, fins go for 100 times the price of meat. And ironically, uh, one of the reasons I, I chose to write about sharks right now is this is the moment of scientific discovery, really the golden age when it comes to research for sharks. So this is a baby lemon shark in B Bimini in the mangroves where we have one of the best uh, findings they just found out about these sharks. These are juvenile sharks because I, I have to confess sharks are terrible parents. They abandon their young right away in most instances and that's actually a good thing because otherwise they, in some instances they might be tempted to eat them. So you have juvenile um, sharks that hang out together in Bimini and recently researchers figured out through tagging that they essentially have cliques that they hang out in. Um, people often had thought of sharks as, as solitary creatures and some of them are but they actually did basically a whole social networking analysis and found that you know that they they have their regular buddies. 
So in Isla Holbosch, Mexico, there's research into whale sharks where they're figuring out these are, again, this is the biggest fish in the sea, but we know remarkably little about it. So they're learning, for example, how they feed. Um, they're, again, they're enormous. They're the size of a school bus or larger, yet they survive on the smallest fish in the sea because they're filter feeders. So, um, you know, basically they've learned that uh, a 20 foot whale shark eats a little under 9,000 calories a day. So basically about 30% more than your average American male. Um, to places like Raja Ampat, Indonesia, where Mark Erdman, who's a scientist for Conservation International, has discovered new species of sharks, that they're these tiny walking sharks that use their pectoral fins to move along the bottom. And so what's interesting there is that they can't go that far, and as a result, you can have separate species very close to one another. And there also, there's a field called biomimicry, some people may be familiar with, where we're figuring out new technologies based on sharks. They're incredible things about how fast they move through the water, they're sensing, the, how they actually smell in stereo. One of the reasons they can track, for example, the scent of their prey is because they literally will smell something in one nostril and then a fraction of a second later, they'll smell it in the other nostril and so they can figure out where to go. Or, for example, the critter cam, which is a camera that's now mounted on both terrestrial and marine life wildlife was actually inspired by a remora, remora that was uh, catching a, a ride on a shark. And so we're learning all this because we have better technology that can get us into the deep ocean. And so we're doing satellite tagging. We're just getting a sense of a kind of this hidden world. And so interestingly, you have a shark lobby that's emerged, uh, not to be confused with the real Washington lobbyists. And really in just the last few years from when I started writing this book in 2007 to now, you've seen a huge uptick in shark activism. It, you know, For example, there's something called CITES, the Convention in International Trade of Endangered uh, Fauna and Flora, which is meeting in Bangkok next year. There's been a real push to try to get some shark species on the list. The deadline for proposals was yesterday, and the oceanic white tip, which went from being one of the most common species in the sea to being one of the most endangered uh, shark species of all, is one that the United States will try yet again to get uh, protected status for. So that gives you a sense of what's going on. And so what you're also seeing is kind of shifting from this culture of, of, of killing sharks and other elasma branks, like this manta ray, to ecotourism. This is Mele, who again was a shark fisherman his entire life. He likes to say that the, the car behind him was paid for by the sharks that he caught. But he's come to the, you know, to find that basically sharks are further uh, ashore, you know, further away from shore. It's much harder. And he's trying to start ecotourism uh, in his community. It's modeled on what they've done in places like Isla Holbosch, where I mentioned their whale sharks. This entire community is centered around whale sharks. That's really what drives their economy now. And again, it's people coming to see them rather than to kill them. There are some limits to it. One of the concerns that we're seeing um, is the fact that, that you might get have too many people who are getting close to sharks, as depicted in this image, that basically, to some extent, it could be disrupting feeding habits. Because one of the ways we know, for example, where whale sharks are going to be off Mexico or off Belize is because red snapper are spawning these eggs. Now, if you have tons of people who are coming there at the very time that whale sharks are trying to eat, what does that do for the whale sharks? And that's something that we're trying to figure out right now. And so one of the other things that's being explored are the establishment of marine reserves. So this is in Raja Ampat, where I mentioned they found that incredible walking shark. They actually auctioned off the name of that shark. It went for half a million dollars. A woman named it after her husband. Um, and as a result, they can hire men like, like this man right here, who now patrol the area and they've limited fishing. The locals are still allowed to get what they need, but as a result, they really are trying to bring sharks back. When I finished my book, uh, I went on vacation with my family, which at that point consisted of my son, who was 18 months old, and my husband, and uh, we went to the beach. And what's so interesting, my uh, son had three words at that point, catch, cracker, and apple, none of which are particularly useful when discussing marine issues. Um, but so we went there, and there was a very long pier, and we walked out to the pier. He insisted on walking. He was just toddling at that point. We went out there, 
And we sat down and he started babbling. I mean, he started talking and talking. And what's fascinating is he was really talking to the sea. I mean, it was very clear he was focused on it. Every now and then he would kind of look back at me and say things that I couldn't understand in gibberish as in, are you getting what I'm trying to express? Um, but it was really the moment that I realized why I had written this book and that really it was because I have been so incredibly privileged in my uh, position at the Washington Post and through writing this to kind of travel the world and to see this underwater universe and that this is something that I'm hoping that my son, who's now three and a half, and my daughter, who's not yet two, that they will basically be able to become divers and, and see kind of ideally a, a sea that's not even just in the shape it is now, but a better one.